LSU fans can't wait to get back inside Tiger Stadium. They'll be in there today as we welcome you to Death Valley for the 2021 LSU Spring Game. And we'll get a great opportunity to look at the offensive line, look at the starting offense against the starting defense, Tom. Outside of the quarterbacks, is there anything that we should keep an eye on throughout the afternoon? Well, you, you just heard Larissa talk about the offensive line. Intact, it's a great area to start if you want to have success in the game of football, but it's the skill guys. They have a lot of fresh faces around the quarterbacks, around the offensive line at wide receiver that they've got to identify. And we mentioned the quarterback battle. Coach O made it very clear there is no starter, there is no front runner, but one of these four guys has to take the first snap of the game, and they give it to Max Johnson. Ed Orgeron telling us yesterday, Mac Johnson getting that opportunity just because of the way he ended last season. Beats Florida in the swamp as a major underdog. It's the freshman passing record in their final game against Ole Miss. Handing off to the starting bell cow, Tyron Davis Price. Don't expect to see a lot of running the football today. Tom, only one healthy running back, and that's Tyron Davis Price there for the Tigers. Yeah, we'll see no John Emery, uh, who they're also very excited about. Trey Bradford also out. So far, we've seen two snaps of this offense, both out of the shotgun. And you referenced Max Johnson getting the start for no other reason than he played well in his final two starts of the 2020 season. But the one thing you do have to note is how efficient he was and protective he was of the football. Eight touchdowns to just one turnover for the true freshman a year ago against Ole Miss. And, of course, the upset win on the road versus Florida. First team defense trying to get off the field on a third and five. Johnson surveys the field, finds his top option. That's Kayshawn Butte. Those two connected for 308 yards and three touchdowns in that final game against Ole Miss. Look at Max Johnson's poise. Works through his progression, starts to his left, works back, finds Butte, who's really the only established guy. He's an electrifying player, great with the ball in his hands in space. But who are going to be the supplemental parts of this receiving core? They're still working through that, and they're going to have some true freshmen coming in in June that will add to the mix come August. Johnson set to throw on first and 10, gets rid of it. Wide open, Boutte there again. Breaks a tackle, makes another man miss. Kayshawn Boutte dances into the end zone to open the scoring here in Baton Rouge. Well, I'll tell you, Jay, we, we talked about how electrifying he is in space. Now watch Max Johnson right here climb the pocket. Really good with his eyes and his feet. Keeps his eyes downfield, finds Boutte. Now this is... You, you hear this offense, this Joe Brady offense, new offensive coordinator, Jake Peets, and you're going to have a vertical portion of it. You're going to have a drive concept. Then you have what they call levels, where they're going to layer somebody at different levels of the field. And that was really what you call an over or an orbit route. And Max Johnson doing a great job of identifying it under duress, getting it out late, and then Butte doing what he does best, and that's making plays after the catch. Now, there was a flag down, but it was thrown on a block. So LSU not back to the original line of scrimmage, still in enemy territory at the 30-yard line. Play action right back to Butte. That's now three straight passes to the number one target, number one, Kayshawn Butte. So, Tom, you know, we... we identified it perfectly who's the second option for lsu in the wide receiver court maybe it's nobody maybe it's Butte all the time <laughs> well I, I think you know john trey kirkland uh Devontae lee trey palmer's another one that's shown flashes but look for number six Deion smith he's had a great spring practice he's made some really acrobatic catches ed orgeron and jake pete the new offensive coordinator rave about his production particularly when contested so sooner or later max johnson and the rest of these tiger quarterbacks are going to have to find somebody outside of number one to throw the ball to great pocket from the first team offensive line this time throwing away from Kayshawn Butte. Take a look at the numbers he yeah. produced. This is quickly becoming wide receiver U. Jamar Chase expected to go in the top 10 of the NFL draft next week. He's trying to follow in those footsteps. Yeah, and, and listen, this this guy, they know who he is. 
established. Do they know what they're getting from him? And that's what spring football is all about is you got to find out who the next man up is going to be. Who's the next target? Who's the reliable guy that your quarterbacks trust and can get in sync with? And that, you know, we've had 14 practices. The spring game's the 15th one. I think LSU still has some identifying to do in that regard. A flag in the secondary. Coy Moore, the intended target. This is a Tiger secondary. Let's talk some defense that Ed Orgeron told us yesterday, Tom. He was furious with the way his defense looked a year ago, particularly those defensive backs continually giving up the big play. The, the bottom line is it was a bad football team on defense. And, and Coach O and their players admit that they were confused. They did not understand what was being asked of them. They did not play smart football because I think they were having to think instead of playing fast. In the first five games of the 2020 season, now this is staggering, LSU on defense with their athletes gave up 60 explosive plays in five games. That's 12 explosive plays of 12 to 15 yards or more per game for five straight weeks. You, you just can't live and, and, and be successful doing that on defense. In the red zone for the first time today, Johnson tucks and runs himself. Now the LSU defense allowed nearly 500 yards a game, most of that through the air. And now they bring in Durante Jones, the new defensive coordinator, comes from the NFL. He coached the secondary under Mike Zimmer for Minnesota last year. Yeah, listen, you see those numbers right there. I mean, they're staggering. I mean, we've become so accustomed to seeing dominant players and dominant performances on defense. And, you know, we, we've got a play coming up here. And, and, and you look at this offense that we're seeing now. You know what? It looks an awful lot like 2019. Defensively, in terms of what they're going to be, looking an awful lot like 2019. Well, why is that? I think Ed Ordron, he went out in this offseason, and he's trying to recreate that magic. So what does he do? Jake Peach, we've talked about. Guess who he's tied to? Joe Brady. Joe Brady obviously left to become the offensive coordinator of the Carolina Panthers. But Durante Jones, who mentioned on the defensive side, he has ties to Dave Aranda. While they were at Wisconsin, prior to getting back into the NFL, Dave Aranda, of course, was the defensive coordinator of that 2019 team. So chemistry, bringing back some of that magic, and familiarity through scheme, I think, was really important to Ed Ordron. Johnson in trouble. Tuckson runs again. Got inside the five. It'll bring up a fourth and goal. These are those moments, Jay, that for spring football, you, you, you get in situations where you want to see what your quarterback does. Okay, well, now you're in the red area. You're plus territory. What do you have to do? you got to be smart with the football. You can't make errors. You can't throw the ball for grabs. And I mentioned Max Johnson in his two starts. Eight touchdowns, just one interception. He hasn't liked what he's seen on the previous two plays, so what does he do? Tucks it, runs, lives to play the next down. Now they're on the six-yard line with another opportunity in fourth and three. And Ed Orgeron wants his defense to try and get off the field here without giving up any points. First team offense against first team defense. First big test on fourth down, and the defense wins it. Great play. Dwight McLaughlin, the sophomore corner, getting his hands in there. So defense wins round one. We get back out onto the field. The LSU spring game continues. Preview of a new look Tigers when we come back. After the first team defense gets the better of the first team offense, we've now got the second team offense on the field. This is TJ Finley. Finley actually started most games of any quarterback last season. Started five games for LSU, went two and three. What are the strengths of TJ Finley, Tom? Arm talent. I mean, he is a big, you see the measurable right there, six foot six, 242 pounds. Really, really powerful arm. Can make all the throws on the field. Probably the best vertical passer just because of sheer arm talent out of the four quarterbacks and getting the number two slot today. Again, still competing. No, no decisions have been made. A great strike over the middle there. Yeah, first pass is a really good one. It's Jontre Kirkland for the first down. See TJ get back, get set, knows where he's at, see his eyes. Good feel and timing. I think that's one thing, and that's just, you know, two throws right there for TJ Finley. We saw Max Johnson on the previous drive. Quarterbacks aren't holding on to the ball. 
They're going through their progression. They're getting the ball out, helping their offensive line. The timing and rhythm of this offense is really important. I think it was something that was lacking in last year's offense. Handoff goes to Nick Deem. As we told you, that the running back room is pretty light between the freshmen not showing up till June, then some injuries, really thin. This is Nick Demas. He's actually a linebacker who converted to running back just so they could have somebody on the second unit. That running back room will be immensely talented once they get everybody in it, but right now it's uh, Tyron Davis Price sitting by himself. <laughs> Second and six for Finley. Clean pocket, but bat down. Tom, I'm curious. You know, the old adage is when you have two quarterbacks, you have none. Well, LSU's got four quarterbacks, so what does that mean? Well, it means that at some point they're going to have a problem. But until they have a problem, don't worry about it. Because right now they've got four guys that are willing to compete, that are battling, that are high-aptitude kids, kids that – all were willing to battle for a job that is wide open. There, there's nobody that's really taken the reins and walked away with this thing, but they've got experience across the board. Now, at some point or another, as we all know, there's only one ball. Transfer portal will come into play, but don't worry about that until you have to worry about that. Third and six for Finley. Steps up. Passes incomplete. You know, it, it's interesting because I think in the age of the transfer portal a lot of kids wouldn't even want to stay and compete they may right. think okay max johnson won the last two games of last season he'll probably get the job or miles brennan will come back healthy he'll get the job why does a kid like tj finley stay and compete because I think it would be different if Miles Brennan had not gotten hurt, had continued to further advance uh, his career because he had gotten off to a great start, 11 touchdowns, three interceptions. But that didn't happen. So everybody got a little sample size. And so it encouraged all these guys to say, you know what, this is wide open. We're coming back and we're going to compete for LSU. We get another look at Max Johnson as these four LSU quarterbacks all are competing for the starting job this spring. Ed Orgeron said this one's going to go down to the wire. They'll compete all spring, they'll compete all fall, and then we'll make a decision. Johnson getting the first snaps with the first team. Plenty of room to run here. Tyron Davis Price with a burst of speed past the 50. You know, Jay, this, this is an area that I think LSU knows that they have got to take the next step. They, they want to run the football. If you're going to be coached by Ed Orgeron, you're going to have a physical nature at the point of attack. They have not been able, whether it is Davis Price, whether it's been John Emery, both highly touted coming out, nobody's really kind of taken the reins and just run away with being the bell cow at running back. I, I think to some degree you might think that they underwhelmed a year ago at the running back position. This is an area, like I said with the wide receivers, that really needs to upgrade its production. Johnson throwing on first down, incomplete. Taking a closer look at Max Johnson, he comes from a football pedigree. His father yeah. had 15 years in the NFL, won a Super Bowl with Tampa Bay. His uncle is Mark Riggs. Max grew up in Athens. You know, he's got his uncle coaching the dogs for most of his childhood. This is a kid that eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Yeah, and his dad, Brad, was able to coach him as well. So, you know, he, he's coming from a really, really strong pedigree. You know, in our quarterback conversation, we were having with these four terrific options. We got we, we to remember, too, you, you still got the four-game redshirt rule. You also have an extra year of eligibility that's been afforded to everybody. So these quarterbacks, while they're competing, they also need to consider the long game. And there's a lot of football to be played for them, whether it's at LSU or somewhere else. But you mentioned how Coach said this thing's going to go down to the water, and I think it is. But they're probably going to get to some point in the summer where one of the quarterbacks starts to see the writing on the wall, and maybe that quarterback isn't with them in August. I hope that's not the case, but you're going to come out of spring, and there's going to be some form of a pecking order, I think. And, you know, we've already seen T.J. Finley a little bit. We'll see Miles Brennan, who started off last year before being lost to a season-ending injury, and then Garrett Nussmeyer, the exciting freshman, who Jake Pete's the offensive coordinator, Jay, as well as Ed Ordron. They had just nothing but glowing remarks about the young freshman and his ability to adapt quickly to major college football. Johnson converts the third and three to get a fresh set of downs here. You know, when we were asking Ed Orgeron about each quarterback that he's got of the four, he, he just loved John's preparation, his competitiveness. Mm -hmm. and 
You know, loved the way that he rallied the team. He got thrust into a pretty difficult situation last fall as a true freshman. They're three and five, and he gets his first career start down in the swamp. They're 27 point underdogs, and he comes out and wins that game. Yeah, yeah, and just and the game wasn't too big for him, Jay. I mean, I think that's the thing as a freshman, you get in that environment. What do you do? And you can tell by their body language. You can tell by their performance. This guy just kind of has it. And and coach mentioned that competitive temperament. He actually said that on all four. So that's the one thing I love about these kids is they're battling. They, they all decided to come back. They knew once they got into that room that the job's up for grabs and that nothing's going to be given to anybody. So they went to work. And if your best players are your best leaders, are your best workers, you got the makings of something special. I think that's what makes this quarterback room really intriguing and, and potentially a special one uh, for this LSU staff. Uh, you called it the best quarterback room in college football, potentially. And offensive coordinator Jake Peets agreed with you. In his first year, he comes in from the NFL, took a look at all four of these guys and said, you know what? All four of these guys are NFL caliber quarterbacks one day. That's high praise mm -hmm. coming from a guy who just came from Carolina, worked with Joe Brady to say all four are capable of getting snaps one day in the National Football League. Yeah, you know, and, and I think he, he saw not only physical attributes, but he saw the makeup and what it takes to potentially be a guy like that one day. Because it's not all just physical tools. It, it's some of the other intangible traits. And, in fact, it often can be difficult to identify until you start working one-on-one -on -one and face-to-face -face with these young kids. So it's been a short sample size and a small one right now for Jake Peets that will continue to grow and enhance over the next coming months leading into the fall. On third and 16, Johnson off his back foot, lets it fly out of bounds. Great pressure from B.J. Ojolari. He's a sophomore defensive end out of Marietta, Georgia, that this LSU team is really high on. He's going to be special, Jay. Uh, he, he's got an opportunity to be a difference maker. Uh, one of those guys that is just so disruptive, you've got to account for him off the edge. I mean, that, that's the one thing. You know, we, we talk about, you know, building championship football teams. Well, where do you do that? You do that from the inside out. LSU's got their entire offensive front back, the bulk of their entire front seven on defense, particularly the front four, all back, all right, and a little bit of a revamped secondary that features really good players that might have been off a year ago, but you know they can play. So there's a lot of excitement with this roster when you look at the returning players. We've talked a lot about the quarterbacks. LSU's got a really good kicker, too. The junior, Cade York, drills a 50-yarder to open the score. LSU should hear Jamar Chase's name kicked to the top 10. So we want to back to back in So fun, Jay, for, for me in particular, and what we do in the coverage of recruiting when you start to identify and see these kids when they're 14, 15 years old. And, you know, a guy like Jamar Chase played with us in the Under Armour All-America game, and then you watch him move on and matriculate through the college and hopefully one day the, the, the professional ranks. And it's just so fun to see the growth of these kids, and it's, it's pretty amazing in today's day and age how so many of these kids just make the leap effortlessly. It's just it's not easy to do. It takes special talents. Who's the next big prospect I guess, on this current LSU team that we'll probably hear their name called a year from now? Oh, man, that is a really, really good question. I would probably say if he gets back to his true freshman form, it's Derek Stingley. Because from a physical attribute standpoint, when he really wants to turn it on, there's nobody better in college football. I think he had a bit of a drop. I don't think he had a lot of fun last year. And I think it affected his psyche. It affected his, his concentration on, on worrying about what he could control, what he couldn't, and, and being his best. So I think he needs to have a rebound here. If he does, he's without question probably the top, cor top corner, at least at this early stage when you say come off the board or being evaluated for guys like Todd Mel uh, when, it, when it comes to next spring. And then a lot of Eli Ricks we won't see today uh, that will be back in the mix will play opposite of him on perimeter. And, and you know, a couple of shifts in the defensive secondary as you see these two guys – Jay Ward moves inside to safety after playing corner. Now you've got a, core, a, a cover corner safety guy on your inside, two perimeter guys on the outside, so they can essentially be in nickel and dime almost all the time and never have to substitute for it on defense. So we know how, how talented LSU's been on defense in years past, and those perimeter guys should be really good again in 2021. 
Uh, Staley was one of only two starters back last year from LSU's national championship team. 19 of the 21 starters not on the roster in 2020, whether it was opt-outs, leaving early from the draft, graduation, and you know, understandably, that led to the growing pains, a three and five sure. star for Ed Orgeron's team. But he really loved the way his team pulled together, kept fighting, and rallied to beat Florida in the swamp. And then all this at the end of the year. He said that's given them a lot of motivation this spring. That most five and five teams in the SEC would be looking at their moves. They actually went in on a positive, you know, two game winning streak. Well, they did, and, and I think at the end of the day, too, the team showed that they got a lot of pride. They were upset with themselves. You know, these seniors, particularly a lot of these guys in the offensive line that could have left, all decided to come back, right? We've talked about the quarterbacks. Nobody jumped into the transfer portal. They all came back. Defensively, they returned a ton of production off of last year's team. Their pride was bruised. I think their ego was bruised. And they've got something to prove. You know, the one thing that I, I always find interesting, because 2019 was such a magical year, right? I mean, you just you can't replicate that. You can bring back players, but you can't bring back chemistry. You can't duplicate the locker room. So you got to start that over. And I think that started with a down year in the fall last year as TJ Finley gets picked off here. But I think that started last year when things were going well as to why this team is getting back to having that strong chemistry. Radarius Jones, interception, number 29 in white, the sophomore, Red Finley's eyes here. Well, the sophomore's playing safety, and it's an area that needs to be addressed in spring football for LSU. Who's going to be their inside guys? We know Todd Harris, I just mentioned Jay Ward moved inside, but a nice job by Radarius Jones there, just sliding underneath and picking off. We talked about layered routes. That's the over route. And that time, I think DJ Finley not being on time and then throwing it behind the target cost him, as you saw, Radarius Jones there undercut it. Jones was a high school quarterback for Horn Lake High School in Mississippi. A dual threat who went 15-0 and his senior year, won the 6A state championship in Mississippi. Do you like guys in the secondary, particularly at safety, Tom, that have that quarterback background too? I love, I love guys on the defensive background that have played anywhere on offense. Running back, quarterback, wide out, because they just see things from a different perspective. And when you, especially when you have guys coming from the high school ranks, and we're seeing so much of that now, these great athletes are all playing quarterback. And if I was a high school coach, I'd do the same, because what do you want to do? You want every ball to be snapped to your best player on every play on offense. You put them at quarterback, you run some version of the Wildcat zone read, and then they're probably going to project to wide receiver, corner, safety. I think the more you can do, the more valuable you become so I, I, I love that and I, I think coaches are looking for that in athletes they're looking for guys that can play in a variety of roles those are football players Max Johnson still in there with the first team offense and his first two drives came away with three points what do you want to see more of from Johnson Tom a little bit more accuracy and maybe some anticipation to getting the ball out underneath. They seem to be taking a, quite a few shots downfield. And listen, you, you want to take some of those shots. You know you probably have some vanilla defensive looks, being that it's a spring game. Now he's under duress and, and going to protect him in a spring game, obviously lay off the quarterback a little bit. But it's interesting because these last two drives, the previous one that led to an interception with P.J. Finley on the other side on offense, and this drive with Max Johnson, it's really been the first two series we've seen where the offensive line has struggled. The offensive line seems to be having a hard time holding up and, and picking things up so the quarterback's got a clean pocket. And let's go down to the sideline. Larisha Harris was more on that team's chemistry. We don't have Larisha right now. We'll try and get her back in. Third and team for Johnson flushed out of the pocket incomplete he's been on the run a lot today Tom and really after that first drive yeah he really has and and again you know you're defense you're, you're not playing a lot of scheme stuff you're pinning your ears you're coming after guys um, they know you're not going to see a heavy dose of the run game because LSU uh, if you're just joining us really depleted in terms of numbers and bodies on offense really only has Taron uh, Davis Price at their disposal you mentioned uh, Nick Demas the linebacker having to come over and sub a running back so defensively you get a little bit uh, a little bit of an advantage knowing that they're probably going to drop back and throw it 
and not having to play much run defense. The quarterbacks are going to have to move around. They're going to have to show some moxie, uh, show that you can make some plays, extend the plays, perform when, when things aren't ideal in terms of conditions around you. And I know it's a pretty vanilla offense as well. Jake Pete's first year offensive coordinator. He doesn't want to open the playbook too much. You talk about the philosophy to get back to what he did under Joe Brady in 2019. But mm -hmm. first year defensive coordinator, Durante Jones, he's got to be pretty happy with that, the way his defense has looked so far. Yeah, because they've won up front, and they've really kind of turned it up uh, within the defensive front, which is the strength of the LSU team. Again, ton of returning production, signed the top junior college player in, in, in Bug Strong uh, out of last year's class that is, is lined up within the front seven, playing linebacker. He's been as advertised. And then you've got a bunch of guys up front, guys like Glenn Logan and Joseph Evans, uh, no, neutral freshman and Mason Smith, the uh, number zero, who – Ed Orgeron is really high on thinks he's going to have an opportunity to be in the rotation sooner rather than later come the fall. And so you, you got to be pleased on defense you're, again if you're Durante Jones. And, you know, I asked him, I said, listen, you weren't here last year. You can't comment on it. You don't know. But what are you expecting out of out of your players from a performance standpoint in terms of what you're asking them to do? And he said, we're asking them to fundamentally be sound, be confident in what they're doing, and play fast so we don't have to think. You know, and so in that regard, they're spoofing them. They're not overloading them with concepts, overloading them with, with, with you know, things that they've got to remember so they have to think all the time. They're going to have a handful of things that they do, get really, really good at those things, feel secure and prominent in those things, then you start giving them a little bit more. You start giving them a little bit more. And that's what the 15 days of spring practice is going to allow for you to do as you head into the summer months. TJ Finley back in trying to shake off that interception on the previous drive. Second team offense still looking for their first points of the game. Gets rid of it quickly. Andre Kirkland, that's his third reception of the day. That'll likely do it for the opening 15 minutes. When we get back, we'll get a deep dive in the NFL draft. Jim Nagy's going to join us, the executive director of the Senior Bowl, helps us out at ESPN. Looking forward to that conversation as we talk quarterbacks, we talk LSU prospects that could be coming off the board hearing their name called and entering the NFL. That's when we come back to start the second quarter at Orgeron. LSU football on FCC Network Plus. Well, it's not full capacity, but boy, what a great sight to see fans back in the stands at Tiger Stadium. Start of the second quarter here in Baton Rouge. Tom Luganbill, Jay Alter with you, Larissa Harris down on the sideline. And Tom, no if or and that's about it. You talk to LSU fans from a year ago. They were disappointed the way this team played from after winning that national championship in such style. And as they prepare prepare for the 2021 fall, big question mark at quarterback, Miles Brennan into the game. Senior who started the season last year, looked pretty good in the opening three games, but suffered a tear in his abdomen which ended his season. What should we look out for when we're talking about Miles Brennan? Well, we, we've got Garrett Nussmeyer jumping in right now. Uh, oh, Nussmeyer. The, the, the freshman, yeah, um, who they've been really excited about. Under Armour All-American uh, off of uh, last year's season, enrolled early. Been really excited with his acclimation to the college level. I think that's, you know, when you're a quarterback, you're, there's just so much going on, right? So you go away from home for the first time. You're enrolled in school. We're in the middle of a pandemic. You don't know anybody. You're on your own for the first time. Oh, by the way, I'm in the middle of a wait conditioning program and now I'm going to be in spring football and I'm expected to perform well he's done I think probably an exceptional job of being beyond what they expected for a young player uh, I you know, don't want to make too many assessments but I'm going to use Ed Ordron's quote here he said he's, he's like a little mini Manziel we're excited about you know some of the things that he creates with his feet and his arm and rolling to his right and throwing to his left and kind of pulling a rabbit out of the hat and you know I called him a riverboat gambler I think he's one of those guys that just kind of has that it factor he's not very big Comes from a coaching pedigree. His dad's been a long-time college NFL coach. See him right there, make a decision. Nobody's open. What do you do? You're a true freshman? Ah, oh, no big deal. I'm just going to throw it away. Those are the things that Jake Pete wants to see from all of his quarterbacks. But when you see a true freshman doing it that's really been practicing with you for 14 days, it's very encouraging. The 
number five of Nussmeyer, not the 15 of Brennan. We will see all four quarterbacks with this first team. It started off Max Johnson. Now it's the true freshman, Garrett Nussmeyer. Jake Pete's joked he should be at his high school prom this weekend. Yeah. Instead, he's going against an SEC defense. Clean pocket, great throw for Nussmeyer, and he picks up the first down on a third and four. Good boys. Yeah, really good poise uh, on platform. Uh, see, uh, those are the things that you like to see. You want, you want to see the, if you're seeing timing, if you're seeing rhythm, that means the quarterback is seeing what he's supposed to see. He's working through the correct progression. He's not holding onto the ball. You're not seeing his eyes go down if he's under duress. All these little things are going to start getting dissected by these coaches as they go into the offseason and use his teaching points and areas that they can show who their players say, hey, listen, this is exactly what we want here. Maybe another play, you know what? We're, that's not where you want to be. Your pre snap reach should have taken you here. Great tools over 15 days of spring ball to take into the offseason when you're implementing a new offense, when you've got new terminology and, uh, you know, maybe some new verbiage in there. But when you see the quarterback doing things in a, a snappy, sense of urgency manner, kind of get the sense that he understands what's going on around him. Tried to squeeze it into that window to Kirkland. How difficult is it for Nussmeyer to, you're so excited you signed for LSU, and then you, you get it, and boy, <laughs> these three guys around me who have already been in this program are really good. Well, listen, if you're worth your salt as a quarterback, you're not going to go anywhere and make college football and be handed the job. You're going to have to compete. And, again, I talked about the long game. You've got the extra year of eligibility. You can still play four games in red shirt. Garrett Nussmeyer's got a lot of football ahead of him. He doesn't need to be worrying about the depth chart. Obviously, he doesn't worry about the depth chart. He, I, I think he sees this as an opportunity, just like the other three quarterbacks do, as a chance to be the guy. They're going to play the guy that makes the best decisions with the football, gets first downs, and puts the team in the end zone. Bottom line, that play right there, all right, what you just saw from Garrett Nussmeyer is what has the coaches excited. That, that ability to evade in the pocket. Now, they do the play dead. Um, but I, I actually think he would have gotten away with this, and he would have he would have uh, made this play. I don't think 99 could have brought him down there. But that's the stuff he does really, really well. Finds the open target and, and, and delivers a strike. So an uh, open competition to me. Um, I don't want a guy that's looking at the depth chart all the time. I don't want a guy that's deciding that he's not going to sign somewhere because they have three other guys in the position. I, I think that's a red flag, in my opinion. So we've seen Max Johnson, T.J. Finley, and Garrett Nussmeyer, maybe Miles Brennan on the field as this quarterback competition continues. Quarterbacks, but the plan from the beginning was to let number 15 go to work. Miles Brennan, he started the season at quarterback, and Tommy might have actually finished the year at quarterback, if not oh, yeah. for a tear in his abdomen. He was playing pretty well when he had that injury. Yeah, I mean, against Missouri, he, he was just flat out ripping it. 430 yards, four touchdowns. In fact, his abdominal injury that required surgery is so rare, they could literally name the surgery after him. I mean, it, it, the doctors just don't see it. And unfortunately, he started to come into his own right when he got injured. 11 touchdowns, just three turnovers. Well, so is it to the other team right there on his first attempt. But this is a guy that he waited, he competed. He battled. He talked about the transfer portal, Jay. This is the guy that could have jumped into the transfer portal, not once, but twice. And he hung around. And you got some pass interference here on, on the defense in what has been a very clean spring game. Haven't had a lot of penalties today. But, Jay, I, I think that when it comes down to it, I'm not saying that he's the leader in the clubhouse, but they have more of a sample size and more of an understanding of him and his style of play and what he was able to produce. Even though T.J. Finley has started five games, he didn't play as well, okay, as Miles did in his three starts. Great poise there to be patient, pick the right pass, pick up five yards. Let's head down to the field for Richard Harris. 
I spoke with Miles Brennan earlier this week, and I asked him just how has spring practice been going for you, and he told me this is the best spring he's had since being at LSU. He's going into his fifth year here, and he says physically he feels 100%, especially after that injury last season. His confidence level is at an all-time high, and he feels more assured in his position. You know what, Larissa? It, it, it's so interesting you say that because this was a guy – as he almost throws another one. Now they're going to get the tie goes to the receiver here. As Keishon Butte ends up getting the catch. But this was a guy that needed Joe Burrow. And I'll tell you why. He didn't understand what it meant to be the quarterback at LSU. Maybe he understood it on the surface. But Joe Burrow came in and, and he had to see what work habits really are. All right, what a commitment to excellence really is, whether it's in the weight room, whether it's in the film room, whether it's in the locker room, whether it's in the classroom. And he took it upon himself to kind of take on that that responsibility. And, and, it, and it's reason he won the job last year. He came in as a 6'4", 175-pound freshman. He's up to 210 pounds now. But he needed a pro like Joe Burrow to show him what it takes to really be the starting quarterback at LSU. And that's not what he was when he arrived on campus. And I'm glad you say that, Tom, because when I was talking to Miles, he basically said that Joe Burrow was his go-to person. He's the guy who assisted him in embodying uh, what he considers his full leadership abilities. And I asked him, what was the biggest lesson you learned from Burrow and he said uh, the next play mentality I had to mm. learn how to have a short-term memory whether I have a good play or bad play I have to focus on what's next and keep it going yeah no doubt Larissa no doubt about it clean pocket here steps up throws a strike Keishon Boudet climbs the ladder that's the play of the day Brennan to Boutte the spark for this LSU offense See Miles Brennan eyes to the right to the middle comes back got his one on one down the sideline and again you see Miles Brennan watch his face mask in his eyes to the right slight to the middle he wants to hold the safety make sure he's got that window downfield for the one on one again good poise you see the option here on the dump off throw these are all things that are showing the coaching staff that they understand what's being asked of them how to go from A to B to C to D the problem I'm seeing develop here Jay is you better come up with some weapons vertically that don't wear number one because folks are going to start rotating coverage. They're going to start bracketing over to wherever number one is aligned and force the quarterback to find other options. Who's going to step up and be those other options for LSU this fall? On the ground game here with Davis Price. Well, I'll ask you, Tom. Who are the options in this wide receiving core? I mean, this is LSU. They should be, you know, pretty stocked at wide receiver, no? Well, I think they're stocked with talent, but they're also stocked with inexperience. So, you know, Jare Jenkins is an interesting guy. He's a junior. Another junior, Trey Palmer, had 10 receptions uh, a year ago. Uh, John Trey Kirkland, we've, we've called his name today, 13 receptions a year ago. Coy Moore is another one, number two. But I think they've also got some true freshmen, guys like Chris Hilton and Malik Neighbors, uh, Brian Thomas. Um, coming in that are freshmen that are going to be expected to contribute. So wide open competition, at least at all of the receiver spots outside of the one that wears number one. Another great play by Dwight McLaughlin, the sophomore out of Texas. I actually saw him, Tom, on the high school football showcase when he was a junior. He played for Trinity Christian, who at the time was coached by Deion Sanders. I mean, yep. you get your secondary player coached by prime time. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> and he's long too, six foot two, 180 pounds. You know, you look at the perimeter players traditionally for LSU. All the corners, everybody's trying to get corners that are six foot or taller, right? They're all six one, six two, six foot at LSU. They can all run, got long arms. Man, you just don't find those guys standing on every street corner. So far, the kicking games looked good today, too, Jack. Yeah, Cade York already hit a 50 yarder. He adds a 46 yarder. That's the only point you've seen so far in Tiger Stadium. Tom Lugan, Bill J. Alter back with you. Right now, it's the defense that has gotten the better of the offense. The only points coming from Cade York. And, and Tom, it was about two years ago in Orlando that we were doing the Under Armour All-American game, and a young kid named Cade York steps up and drills a 59-yarder to win the game. Yeah. 
off the ground. I mean, he hammered that thing. And then to see what he did against Florida this last year, I was like, yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, as we get another look here at the freshman Garrett Nussmeyer, early enrollee, true freshman out of the 2021 class. Look at the formations we've seen from LSU. I mean, is this vintage 2019, four wide, five wide, spread the field horizontally. You've got an inside run game. Um, everything is get the ball to the quarterback's hand, get it into the, uh, the hands of the playmakers. As we've talked about today, Jay, the question is, who are some of those playmakers going to be? Who's going to emerge to be the next Terrace Marshall, to be the next Jamar Chase? Who, who's it going to be? Eric Gilbert, too, is another position at tight end we have not discussed yet, Jay, as it relates to a revamped position at the tight end position with the Tigers. And Eric Gilbert, who entered the transfer portal, may still be an option to come back. Well, it was interesting. I asked Ed Orgeron yesterday directly, what is the deal with Gilbert? He said, we met with him. We liked what he said. He liked what we said. We presented a plan, a path that would bring him back to LSU, re-enroll him in school and put him in a Tigers uniform. He said they have not heard what his decision is, but there is a path on the table for Gilbert to come back and what a boost he would bring to this offense. Oh, absolutely. And, and you, need, you take a look at, at Jake Peets, who's trying to identify who these players are going to be. Who's going to be the tight end? Am I going to have an Eric Gilbert? Who are going to be some of these su su supporting cast members at wideout, at running back? See some of the stops there. And that, 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 you know, the one with Alabama in 2018, although it was brief, it's important to note because the players that are now playing at LSU, Jake Peets has a lot of familiarity with. They're recruiting the same guys. They identified and visited the same kids, had the same kids on campus. So when he took this job as the offensive coordinator, he wasn't coming into the situation completely unaware of the talent pool at LSU. Intercepted. Nussmeyer tried to sling it over the middle. That won't work. Antoine Sampa got in front of that one. Now the second interception we've seen from the second team defense against the second team offense. Yeah, over the middle here, and he just doesn't see Sampa. He think, thinks Sampa is going to come across with number 16, Devontae Lee, on the drive route, and he looks like he's going to do it, but then he doesn't. He backs up into the void, kind of baited the young freshman. That's a great lesson for the young freshman to learn at quarterback, and, and he pulled the trigger, ball was out, but didn't quite see what the defender was baiting him into there. Going back to Jake Peets for a second, first-year offensive coordinator for Ed Orgeron's team. And not to disparage Peets because he is his own man, but he got the sense from talking to Ed Orgeron, he really wanted to go and rehire Joe Brady. Well, you couldn't do that, so let's take somebody from Joe's staff. Peets was Brady's offensive uh, assistant quarterback's coach for Carolina, so it, it should be, philosophically at least, a good match here for Peets in LSU. It should be. And, and I asked Coach Order on that point blank. I said, are you trying to get back to that familiarity and some of that chemistry that this offense brought? He goes, absolutely. I needed the Joe Brady offense. He said it right to us. Um, he, he loves the energy, the enthusiasm, and the work ethic of these coaches. He said they're very detailed, very organized, likes what he's seen so far in the offseason. So Jake Peets, obviously, is going to be a first-time play caller, knows this scheme inside and out, and this is the scheme that, that Ed Ordron wanted to get back to, and it probably is the best fit for LSU's players right now. After the 5-5 five and five season, Orgeron called Brady and said, who should I hire? And not that that was the end-all, be-all, right? You go through the yeah, thorough sure. interview process. But Brady's answer was Jake Peets. You know, he's right on my staff. This is the guy you need. And here we are in spring ball getting to look at Peets' offense. Well, and I think, too, from Ed Ordron's vantage point, he knew from an X's and O's, from a scheme, from a terminology standpoint, from a personality standpoint of how you teach and how you coach, he knew exactly what he wanted because he'd already had it. So how do, you, how do you replicate that? Everybody's going to be their own man, as you mentioned. But he got the things that he was looking to get, so offensively they are what he wants them to be now. Batted down to the line of scrimmage. This defensive line, that time it was Logan getting his paw in there. Glenn Logan, the senior out of Louisiana. This defensive line's looked really good, Tom. They've given every yeah. quarterback in there fits today. Glenn Logan, senior, okay? You've got uh, Neil Farrell, senior. But then you've got some young guys uh, in there, Landon Jackson, Jacobian Gilroy, 
Jaqueline Roy. This is a really deep and talented group. A lot of returning starts. A year ago, I only had two returning starts on defense coming off of that national championship roster. So looking like they're going to be getting back to form defensively. And again, simplifying, making sure their kids aren't thinking but are playing fast by spoon feeding them the defense and introducing things in stages. I, I you know, we're not going to see a lot today in terms of scheme and pressure and all that stuff. They're going to be pretty vanilla, but um, I, I like the approach. I think this is what they needed to get back to because when you have the athletes LSU does, Jay, you don't need to overcomplicate things. You're going to go into the majority of the games that you play with better players than the opponent. Four quarterbacks battling for that starting spot. None of them have made it to the end zone yet. Miles Brennan trying to be the first, the senior who won this job a year ago, the veteran of the group, lone senior, who started the season last year. You mentioned the unique injury, Tom, the tear in his abdomen that the doctors had never seen before. They said if they did do surgery, they'd have to name it after him, so he opted for yeah. no surgery, healed naturally. If he can get back to the ability, would you say, in your estimation, this is not it coming from LSU. They made it clear. No yeah. front runner. Is he your front runner? Yeah, he is by a nose. I, I think, to be honest with you, if it's just me looking from the outside in, it's Miles and, uh, and, and probably Max. And then it's going to be a real battle between Nussmeyer and, and TJ to get into that mix. But I... This guy has played good, solid football. They know what to expect from him. He knows the offense already inside now because he's been a part of it. All right, he, he knows exactly what's expected of him. And so I think that gives him a couple of advantages. But there's a lot of football to be played in the summer and in fall camp that will make that determination. That's not hey, fair. You read a quarterback sneak. I was going to say. In, in, well, wait a minute. <laughs> We're not supposed to be tackling uh, the quarterback. <laughs> that's great. I love it. There you go, Jake Peets. Bend them rules. That's great. <laughs> Coach O's going to let it happen. He loves the fire, the competitiveness from this team, but he also said that it's a pretty unselfish group when they're off the Ooh. field not competing with one another. Great team chemistry. Brennan let that ball loose, but hopped right back on it. Actually, as Davis Price uh, gets popped right here, mm. And the ball goes down, and, and Miles Brennan, Johnny on the spot, thank goodness. Again, situational football. You're in plus territory inside the five. What you can't do is turn the ball over, and uh, good wherewithal there by, by Miles Brennan. And, and you're right about the, the competitive nature of this whole team. Think about it. They're, they're down in numbers at running back, and, and Coach O and Coach Peets both stated that, wow, we have problems at running back. Every wide receiver on our team is trying to jump in at running back. And Orgeron took a timeout. We'll take a timeout as well. Second and goal. First team offense, first team defense. Tom Luganville, Jay Alter with you. We're now joined by Jim Nagy, the executive senior director of the Senior Bowl. And, and Jim, we'll take people behind the curtain. We've been trying for the better part of the second quarter to get you on. So we are very happy that you are now joining us. Uh, LSU spring game. Let's talk LSU. NFL draft coming up. Draft analyst for us for ESPN. Jamar Chase, where do you expect him to go off the board, and what does he bring to an NFL roster? Well, I expect him somewhere in that top ten range. I mean, I don't think he's going to get out of there. Uh, I was at that pro day. He put on quite a show with the 11 foot broad jump. I timed him at 4.38 myself. There were there were a couple guys behind me that had him 4.34. Um, so he's got all the physical stuff. The tape was great. Um, the most physical receiver in this year's draft. One of the most physical guys since Anquan Bolden. So I think the first place he could go off would be Cincinnati. Um, you know, a cool reunion with his old quarterback, Joe Burrow, at five. Um, but he's not going to get past a team like Detroit, um, who's sitting there at seven. Jim, you know, you've been in this a long time at the NFL level. And, you know, we look at LSU and it's college football fans look at LSU and they see this program with great athletes, great players. As a scout, as a GM, as a coach in the National Football League, how do you view LSU's player pool, the guys that come out year in and year out? How, how is this program viewed? 
Oh, uh, they're an elite program. Um, they're, they're an elite producer of talent. You can just go on up and down any NFL roster, and you look at certain positions where they've had a, a ton of success cranking guys out, and that's wide receiver, defensive back, uh, linebacker. I mean, you name it. I mean, they're really uh, – Joe, Joe Burrow now a quarterback. I mean, that would really be historically the one position where they, they maybe haven't turned out guys that have become great pros. But everywhere else, running back, I mean, you name it. It's, uh, it's an elite, elite program. Jim, you mentioned, you know, Chase, and obviously they've got a lot of talent that was on that national championship team. We didn't see a, a lot of it on the field in 2020. Chase was an opt-out. But who else do you expect to hear their name called that wore a Tigers uniform a year ago? Who stands out to you? Yeah, I think Jabril Cox, the linebacker transfer from North Dakota State, is going to have his name called somewhere pretty early on day two. He's kind of that space linebacker that the league's looking for right now that can just run and chase and hit and cover. And that's what he did at such a high level here at the Senior Bowl was, was cover tight ends. So, uh, you know, I'd say Terrace Marshall, the wide receiver, another guy just like Chase. He, he blew out the pro day running low four fours at almost six foot three. So different player than Chase, obviously, but a guy that's going to hear his name called pretty early on day two. And then you, you can go all the way through the draft and they're going to have players. I think Jacoby Stevens is an interesting guy. Uh, with his 42-inch vertical jump and 10-10 broad jump, kind of that hybrid linebacker safety. I do think Jacoby's a little better, closer to the line of scrimmage. Uh, he's at minimum going to be a great special teams player, but I think he really intrigues a lot of teams that are looking for that positionless hybrid guy that can match up with tight ends and, and play inside the box. Jim, sticking with, with Jacoby Stevens, um, you had him down at the Senior Bowl. How did he perform and stack up during the week in your estimation? I thought he did a great job. You know, like I said, he's got that hybrid ability, kind of like Divine Diablo was a guy from Vatech who's really yeah. taken off since the senior bowl. He's probably going to be a top 40, top 50 pick. Um, but where you saw Jacoby show up was in the coverage stuff. A lot of man coverage stuff you didn't see a lot of at LSU. Um, but he answered a lot of questions in terms of his explosiveness. Uh, you know, I, I will say this, and I've talked to Jacoby about it. His first half of the season was a little rough, um, almost looked a little disinterested, a little maybe a little national championship hangover. But the second half of the season, he really turned it on, had a great senior bowl, had a great pro day. So he's going into the draft with really, really nice momentum. Jim Nagy, Senior Director of the Senior Bowl, as well as an ESPN draft analyst joining us now. We'll get you out on this. I know we're talking LSU primarily, but the NFL draft seemingly year in and year out, all about the quarterback. So I'll put you on the spot for this one. If Joe Burrow was in this quarterback draft class, does, does he get the one nod? Is it Lawrence? Do you have Wilson Fields? How, how would he stack up with his group? I would say Joe would be right there with Trevor Lawrence, and it would just it would just depend on what what you're looking for at the position. I mean, Joe had a phenomenal year last year. I think that what's being lost a little bit in the in this year's draft conversation is Mac Jones in, in how com comparable he is to Joe Burrow in terms of their resumes. You know, both guys went into their senior years as probably third, fourth round picks for most teams, undefeated national championships, very similar skill set. And I don't know if it was the Joe Cool factor and everyone loved Joe, but he was embraced as that number one overall pick. And this year we're getting a ton of blowback on Mac Jones, so that's been interesting. But he would have been right up there with Trevor Lawrence as, as the top player in this year's draft. Do you have Jones after Lawrence as the number two quarterback in this class? No, I have, I have Wilson. I have Mac three. Tom, you got a thought on that or? Well, listen, I, I, I got to see these guys so often from high school all the way through to college. And seeing Zach Wilson last year in person, I, I, I just thought he was exceptional. And, you know, Jim, we're, we're in nitpicking season, right? We got to find something wrong with all of them. And I think the intri intriguing <laughs> yeah. thing about Mac Jones is the thing we want to find wrong about him is that he had elite players around him as if that's something bad. Right, right. You know, and you didn't hear a lot of that with Joe Burrow, which I thought was interesting. And you certainly yeah. didn't hear a lot about it with Tua. 
Um, it, you know, and Tua had Ruggs and Judy and a, and a healthy Jalen Waddle for the entire season. So um, yeah. it's interesting. You're right. This is total nitpick in time. The closer we get to the draft, you start hearing a lot of the, the negativity coming out. It's my least favorite part of the process. Um, <laughs> I like to more. I, I like to um, accentuate more of the positives when I talk about these players. Jim Nagy, executive director of the Senior Bowl ESPN Draft Analyst. Thank you for the time, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thanks, guys. The LSU spring game continues here. We've only gotten field goals so far. All the points have come from the boot of Cade York, who probably will be an NFL kicker one day, Tom. For kickers are NFL people, too. Yeah. Kickers are and people, our, too, Jay. You know, it's he, interesting. He might, go ahead. No, I was going to say he might be. I asked you earlier, who's the best uh, NFL prospect in this game? It might be Kate York. <laughs> yeah, it, it might be, especially for longevity of a career. He could be one of those guys that goes for a long, long time. You know, I, I want to get back to something as, as we just talked to Jim. And, you know, it, and I mentioned it's nitpicking season. and We're, we're talking about Mac Jones. And it, listen, I, I can see a lot of different angles around him. Um, it, it's interesting to me. He For us coming out of high school, he was a six foot one. 185-pound late bloomer. We had him graded as a four-star player. He was not in the ESPN 300. He just wasn't physically advanced yet. And he had been committed to Kentucky, okay? He ends up switching late to the University of Alabama and signs in the same class as Tua. And I think a lot of people looked at that at the time and said, hey, they needed to get another arm. They needed to get more depth. And the kid was willing to do it, okay? And right, wrong, or different. The kid signs, doesn't care that Tua's there. Red shirts bides his time. But I do get curious to wonder if he'd signed with Kentucky and played, let's just say he started for two years there, because he only started for one at Alabama. Would we be talking about him as a top 10 pick? No chance. And I, I, I don't think we would be. And that's not, that's not his fault. It is a reflection on the talent level around him. I, you know, I, to me, when you're going to talk about a guy as a top 10 or a top 5 pick at the quarterback position, you're saying that that guy's going to be the face of our organization for a decade, and we're expecting him to take us to the Super Bowl. You look at this lineup of quarterbacks that are on that roster at the same time, and oh, by the way, we mentioned Jalen Waddle, Devontae Smith, Henry Ruggs, Jerry Judy. All of them guys were on the roster at the same time, too, all on one team. I had this question that I was posing to people, and I'm going to pose it to you, Jay. If you took Zach Wilson and you had him play for Alabama last fall, and you took Mac Jones and had him play for BYU last fall, would BYU have the same season that they had? You could argue no. I, I would say... You could argue no. But if Zach I Wilson would, would in Alabama, would, would you say Al the same? Al Zach Wilson no, Alabama in Alabama would have, would have the same, same season. Year. Yeah, Alabama I, I, I would think have so the too. identical year they'd be national champions. Yeah. yeah, and one of the things, too, and, and I... Again, we're, we're nitpicking here, and it's something that I went back and did during the fall because the completion percentage was so remarkably high, uh, which is a, a credit to Mac Jones. But I'm kind of looking at why. So one of the things that Alabama did is they had this pre-snap RPO game where they would motion a player. It could be any player. That player would go in motion. And how the defense responded to that was what dictated the decision for Mac Jones before the ball was even snapped. If you go back and run the numbers, Mac Jones completed 92% of his passes last fall on all plays that included motion. Well, what does that tell you? Is that a red flag? Is that saying, well, wait a minute, maybe that 77% completion percentage isn't overly accurate? I don't know. That's for the NFL guys to do. But there's just there's so much to dissect when you're talking about a guy that maybe from a physical attribute standpoint isn't Zach Wilson. He isn't Justin Fields. He's not Trey Lance. He's not Trevor Lawrence. So there's there's just a lot to digest there with him. And I think I think so much of it has to do with with Kyle Shanahan and Matt Ryan's performance together in Atlanta and seeing a similar marriage with Mac Jones in San Francisco. And I liked what Jim mentioned about Joe Burrow, too. Why isn't Mac Jones getting the love that a Joe Burrow did? Because you could have said, well, right. yeah, Justin, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. Terrace Marshall. To me, yeah, exa exactly. To me. Clyde edwards Alaire. And, and you're, you're the draft expert. You, you've seen these guys since, since they've been in diapers, pretty much. But to me, there was that swagger of a Joe Burrow you could go into uh, an NFL locker room and lead right away and maybe Mac Jones does have that 
Mm -hmm. But it would surprise me if Mac Jones goes to San Francisco and gets beaten out for the job by Jimmy Garoppolo. Oh, that wouldn't surprise me one bit. Uh, there, there's no question about that. The problem with Jimmy Garoppolo is he can't stay healthy. And, you know, we, we, you talk about that, that magic, that leadership, that feel, that it, that poise. All of those things have been reflected uh, with Mac Jones in his interview process. I think he has aced the interview process in this offseason and draft preparation as good as any quarterback in, in the pool, which, again, on top of on-field performance, really ups your stock. And so as we look at LSU, we talked about Joe Burrow having that. Miles Brennan's under center right now. We know what he's done. You know, he threw three t 11 touchdowns to three interceptions a year ago. He's got to stay healthy. If he does, you know, with this offense back in kind of that Joe Brady mold uh, under new offensive coordinator Jake Peets, who's to say we're not talking about Miles Brennan throwing for 4,800 yards and 47 touchdowns in the fall? He faked the spike, unloads a deep ball. Brennan for the touchdown Brennan, finds Kayshawn Boutte for the first touchdown of the day and it comes off a fake spike he fooled his own defense there tom <laughs> he fooled his own defense he fooled us as well but this is spring ball we get a spike that doesn't do you any good let's go ahead and throw it down field again he looks left keeps any safety danger away says one-on-one -on -one, my best playmaker Keishawn Butte, the one known commodity that you can truly trust right now in this receiving core for miles brennan and the other three quarterbacks competing has been as advertised today. He's been really, really good every time they've gone to him. Again, the question for LSU, and it will roll into the summertime, it will roll into fall camp, who are going to be the other options? So the first touchdown of the 2021 spring football season here in Baton Rouge comes off a fake spike and a great throw from the senior, Miles Brennan. You know, it's, it's so interesting how one-on-one -on -one and what coaches call 50-50 balls or contested matchups. You're playing right there. If, if, if you're a Butte, you're playing a, against McLaughlin, and he is two inches taller than you, and you go up and win the 50-50 ball battle. And, that, and that's what college football has turned into. It's so one-on-one -on -one matchup oriented now. And you have playmakers that can go up and take it. That's why Jamar Chase and Terrace Marshall and, and these guys are so good uh, with the ball up when contested, just making plays. The first half ends with a touchdown for Miles Brennan. Four quarterbacks competing for one starting job. Brennan was actually the last of the four quarterbacks to enter the spring game, but definitely left a great mark there. That was a strike to Keishon Butte and Butte who had a terrific end of the freshman season, 308 yards against Ole Miss, three touchdowns in that game is picked up right where he left off. He had a really strong first half. We'll step aside. Halftime here at Baton Rouge of the 2021 spring football game. From Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the first half. Few fireworks, but one right at the end of it. Miles Brennan found Keishon Butte on a 39-yard touchdown strike. Tom, what are you looking to accomplish in spring football? You get these 15 practices. What are you looking to do? Well, you, you spent the offseason while your kids are in their winter conditioning program. You as a coaching staff, you finished up recruiting, and now you start to sell scout. You start to look at your team and evaluate your team, look at what you did last fall, study the tape, study your players, and identify where do you have holes, where do you lack depth, maybe where are you not as talented as you'd like to be. And you, and you go in with some goals in your 15 days to say, okay, we need to identify X, Y, and Z at this position. We need to establish depth at these two positions here. Who are those guys going to be? You want to create an open environment of competition, but it's also a time to find out if your young kids, particularly some of your young kids that are now going to be expected to develop into established starters, are they ready? And getting them significant reps, enough reps to where you can make a determination going into the summer to say, okay, we're not far left along yet. Yes, we've answered these questions. We still haven't, uh, don't have enough answers for these questions. And you, you try to use these 15 days to set those goals, accomplish those goals so that you know more than you knew in February as you head into June and July leading into August. 
And for LSU specifically, they've got a quarterback competition, a new offensive coordinator, a new defensive coordinator. Is it too early in the spring to start installing the offense and the defense that these coordinators bring with them, or are you just looking for more general schemes, or, or are you really getting to the nitty-gritty in, in spring? Well, I, I think with, with two new coordinators, you're, you're installing, you're seeing how kids grasp and learn what they can process, when you maybe need to dial back, maybe when you need to push harder. But you want them to be confident. You want them to play fast. You want them to be a football team that believes in what you're doing. And so I, I think it's a bit of a slow burn for this particular football team. It may not be like that for a program that's got, you know, their entire staff returning intact. So now it's T.J. Finley's turn with the first-team offense. We saw Max Johnson and Miles Brennan with the first-team offense in the first half. Very interesting. The Tigers have four quarterbacks, and Ed Orgeron made it clear. All four guys have an equal chance at this job. We don't have a front runner. We don't have a starter. All four guys are going to get a crack at this. In the spring, if you're a quarterback, how can you separate yourself from the pack, Tom? Don't turn the ball over. I, I think that that more than anything else, you've got to prove to the coaching staff that not only do you understand what they're asking of you, but more importantly, do you protect the ball? Do you move the chains? Um, is the offense advancing forward? If, if you turn into somebody that can't be trusted with the football, then you're going to take yourself out of the competition. And so I think over the course of those 14, 15 days, we're in day 15 now with the spring game here at LSU, um, all of that stuff's being charted. Don't, don't kid yourself. The, the, every single rep you're taking at the quarterback position is being charted. It's being examined. Was the ball caught? Was the ball dropped? Did you turn the ball over? Did you make the right read? Did you throw the ball within the catch radius? Did the receiver have to make an adjustment? All of these things are being scrutinized because you've got to be able to instill trust uh, in the coaching staff that you're the guy that can get the job done. Clean pocket for Finley. Delivers a strike to Jonte Kirkland. That's his fifth grab of the day. Goes for a first down. Where are the areas that T.J. Finley needs to improve as a quarterback, Tom? I think it's consistent accuracy. You heard me talk about ball placement. And, and you know, do your targets have to adjust? Or do you throw a catchable ball where they can, what I call, pluck and run, you know, and, and not have to transition and make make it difficult he's the guy with the biggest arm but i think he's probably the guy too that needs to work on the most consistent accuracy overall um physically ed ordron talked about him this week you know six six almost 245 pounds uh powerful arm can push the ball vertically he did start five games but his production in those five games maybe wasn't as good as the production of Max Johnson in his two starts and certainly not as, as productive as Miles Brennan in his th first three starts of the season a year ago. He's completed three straight passes in at the backfield here, Finley. His first drive with the first team offense going against the first team defense, and that's incomplete. What's impressed you most about this first team defense, Tom? Everybody was questioning the secondary, you know, and, and we see a play right there uh, that was just made um, from the safety position, and that's the, the, the position that people have questions marks about. You've got Derek Stingley on the one side of corner. Opposite is Eli Ricks. He's not playing today. Um, McLaughlin was right there, number two, safety. you got Todd Harris, and then, of course, Jay Ward that moved from corner inside. So how do you shore up that back end group? You know you have talent. You know you have length. The front seven is the, is the position that you know enough about because you have so many established starts and, and established production. They've been really as advertised today. This has been a group that's created consistent pressure up front. Well, and that's what was so surprising about a year ago. When you look at the LSU defense in 2020, allowed nearly 500 yards a game, most of that through the air. And you look at the roster, Tom, the talent is all over the field in the secondary as the defense comes out with a big fourth down stop there, particularly at Derek Stingley, who was so good in his freshman year, and he kind of is a, a microcosm for really how 
bad at secondary looked at times a year ago. Yeah, it, it was it was one of those deals where you looked at LSU and the kids did not look confident. They didn't look engaged. They didn't play fast. I think there were there was a lot of um, questioning what they were doing, not believing in the scheme and the system and what was was being implemented. And you you can't be at your best athletically if you're unsure of or you don't believe in 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 what's going on. And that was where things needed to start uh, as you kicked off spring football. Dron T. Jones, the new defensive coordinator, Ed Ordron, spoke with us about, you know, starting every snap with your, your feet in the ground, your hand on the ground, getting back to the base fundamentals and keeping things simple. We got two good athletes here to have to overcomplicate things. And, and he's right. I mean, you, you can't, you can't have LSU caliber talent on defense and in the first five games give up 60 explosive plays, 12 explosive plays per game at LSU, at LSU. So that's where it begins and ends. And, and you know, they seem to be excited. There seems to be an enthusiasm. Uh, Durante Jones told Derek Stanley, point blank, go have fun. You weren't having fun last year. Football's supposed to be fun. Enjoy this. And I, I think that, you know, you're seeing some smiles on some faces. Kids seem to be back into the confidence of what they're being asked to do. Durante Jones shared that at the beginning of camp as he's getting his arms around the talent that he has on defense, they just had one play in one practice where everything went to plan. Everybody did their job. And he said that was the aha moment. The guy started looking around and said, you know what? We are pretty good. We do have a lot of talent on this defense. Now we have to go and show it in the SEC. Well, it's so interesting you say that because that one play, right? You take that play and you put it on tape. You put your entire defense in the defensive snap room. You put that thing up and you go position by position and you point out why everything worked. You did what you could, were coached to do. You were where you were supposed to be. Your technique was how it is being taught, and look what happens. It gives you this great coaching moment as you take a look at some of the stops there for Durante Jones. And again, that familiarity. Uh, Dave Aranda, very successful here as a defensive coordinator prior to becoming the head coach at, at Baylor. He, he was one of the guys that Ed Orgeron called recommended Durante Jones. They worked together with each other uh, at Wisconsin. So that familiarity and confidence, whether it was through scheme, terminology, how you're going to coach the defense. And don't kid yourself, Jay. I mean, Ed Ordron told him point blank, I'm going to be involved in the defense. Are you okay with that? <laughs> and he said, I'm a front guy. Durante Jones is the back end guy. That's not really where, where my expertise is. And, and they all seem to come to an agreement. Yeah, Ed Orgeron did joke with us. He said, by the way, you're going to have your head coach peep it in on the defensive line. And Jones said, no problem at all. Ed Orgeron, one of the best defensive line coaches in the entire country, one of the best minds on the defensive side of the football. So to have that as a first-time defensive coordinator is actually a big boost for Jones. No, I, I think that players like it when the head coach is intimately involved in the coaching of a position or the overseeing of a position. No different than Nick Saban in the secondary or that Ordron it's in the front. You're engaged with those kids on a daily basis. You're not just walking around overseeing things. Uh, I think players respect that. They, they know they're getting one-on-one -on -one, hands-on training from the guy whose record goes next to his name. And uh, I think that's a healthy thing. Defensive coordinator, Coach Jones, I asked him who is one of the most uh, improved players this spring, and he mentioned Damone Clark. And when I talked to Damone Clark, he said, man, Coach Jones has really been helping me to be great. When I first met him, I told him that I want to be great. And ever since then, he's been pushing me to take that next step. And he says that Damone sees the improvements within himself. Marisha, great stuff there. What a throw that was with plenty of people. In his face, Max Johnson steps up and heaves one to the end zone for a touchdown. Take another look at this. Yeah, and he and he finds Kirkland there, number 13, just over the outstretched arms of the defender there, number uh, six in the in the back end. And Derek Davis, who's a freshman out of Pennsylvania for LSU, we saw this in the first quarter in the first few drives for Max Johnson. Under duress, people in his face, doesn't let his eyes come down, climbs the pocket. Keeps the focus downfield where it needs to be and delivers a strike. On the on the play. 
pass interference defense. Here we are praising the defense, and they've been great. Even got great pressure in on that play, and I think if you're able to hit the quarterback, maybe they come up with the sack, but Johnson steps up. Heaves one to the end zone, and that'll be good for him to see, too, because in his first couple of drives, Tom, there was just something missing there. Mm -hmm. We didn't see the same flashes that we saw in the swamp when he was a 27-point underdog and gets the win against Florida in his first start last fall. But we saw the same poise. I think that's one thing to note is the poise that we saw on the road in the swamp, the poise we saw against Ole Miss, you're seeing that today too. People in your face, navigating the pocket, trusting what's in front of you. Uh, that's just an innate sense of instincts that Max Johnson has. On a third and 19, dials up a touchdown throw to put purple on the board. By the way, you're seeing an absolutely terrific performance by John Trey Kirkland. That his 12th catch, now a touchdown, 111 total yards. You were talking about the wide receiver depth chart after Kayshawn Boutte. Well, maybe John Trey Kirkland can get into that mix. Yeah, and he, he's playing both sides here. He just took his purple jersey off, putting the white jersey on, and now he's got to go play for the other team. So he's getting all the reps he can, he can take, as we talked about having to identify who's going to be the other playmakers around the established Kayshawn Boutte. As we look at the numbers here, Jay, you know, um, Kind of what you'd expect. This has been the competition, right? I mean, look at 7 to 12, 6 to 12, 8 of 14, 11 to 15. This is why this has been such a strong four man competition. It's not like, you know, two guys are laying an egg and other two are just jumping to the forefront. They're all kind of doing the same thing. Yeah, if you're just joining us, four guys all competing to be the starter here at LSU. There's no front runner, there's no clear choice for Ed or Geron. I'm just impressed, Tom, how they got all four of these guys to stay. Because in the world of college football, really the world of college athletics, the transfer portal is so hot. How did they convince four guys to all try and compete for a starting position? Miles Brennan getting hurt. Because had he not been hurt, he was really starting to get hot. Had that monster game versus Missouri. Goes down, season-ending injury. And now there's not an established starter. LSU's not going into spring football with a guy that played, what, you know, 11, 12 games. Instead, they're going into spring football with a guy that started five games. And TJ Finley right there, big number 11, two games, then a 2-0 and record for, for Max Johnson. And then the first three games, of course, with, with Miles Brennan and Garrett Nussmeyer as a true freshman. So without an established starter, why would you not return? You got an extra year of eligibility that was afforded to everybody a year ago, and you've got an open competition with no front runner. I, I applaud these kids. Now, is that going to be a problem that's going to arise? Absolutely. Uh, but you know what? You deal with that when you have to deal with that, and that's not right now. You started the show today before we saw anybody take the field saying this is probably the best quarterback room in college football. It was kind of a statement that I wanted to return to. What makes you say that? Because a, a lot of people would say, well, they don't have a clear starter. How good could it be? Well, they, they do have four guys all capable of it, right? Sure. So you've got four players, scholarship players, on a roster at one time. We're in the transfer portal era. That's darn near impossible to accomplish. So they, they've got that right now. And I say that in, in terms of talent. I, I look at physical ability. I look at production. I look at snaps. Did you play some meaningful snaps? All right, outside of Garrett Nussmeyer, all of these guys have played meaningful snaps. Miles Brennan's been in this offense already, okay? If I were to take the, that comment I made about the strongest overall quarterback room in college football, and I were to now look at Ohio State. Ohio State has two players, all right? C.J. Stroud, Jack Miller, and a third incoming player in Kyle McCord. Not one of those players has attempted a pass in a college football game. Not one single pass in a college football game. So it, it's a rare, it's a rare room to have in today's college football climate, and it is a great problem to have, and very few people have it. And the other thing is right now they've got committed in the class of 2022, the number two quarterback according to our ESPN 300, Walker Howard. Yeah from Lafayette, Louisiana. So that'll add another dimension to this quarterback room. Yep, and, and, and really athletic too. And, and again, by the time that comes around, the likelihood that one or more of these four not being within this program at that time is, is 
is probable. I mean, that's the reality of the situation in the world that we're living in right now. Because I think the transfer portal is a quarterback portal. It, it's really, I mean, you're you're not seeing a ton of players moving into the transfer portal that are that are being picked up everywhere else that are playing in multiple positions and, and having major impacts at other schools. But the quarterback is a position that's always needed. So people are going to fish the portal for quarterbacks. Right now it's Max Johnson in, the sophomore out of Athens, Georgia, the nephew of Mark Richt. His father, Brad, played 15 years in the NFL, won a Super Bowl with Tampa Bay. Quarterback keeper. This is just unfair. You can't hit the guy. That's a free first down for Max Johnson. <laughs> Yet he's moving so fast as if he might just get popped. <laughs> Who, who's the most athletic of these four? Garrett Nussmeyer. Um, but he's also the smallest in terms of dimensions. Uh, his measurables are going to be more in the Baker Mayfield, uh, you know, type of mold, uh, uh, a Tua type of mold, more in the six-foot type guy, where these other kids are, you know, 6'4", six, 6'4", four, six, four, and 6'6". Six, six. And if, if Garrett's six foot two, then he's grown two inches since I saw him last. <laughs> <laughs> and 172 pounds. He's yet to hit a college weight room, whereas Finley's That's right. 242, Johnson's 220, Brennan's 210. I mean, what's great Look about Nussmeyer is that, is that he, yeah, terrific throw by Johnson. Take another look at this. This is right on the money from the sophomore. And again, Jontre Kirkland, who we just saw catch a touchdown, uh, seeming to kind of emerge as maybe being that that, that other guy opposite, opposite of uh, Keishon Boutte. And another real nice drive here from Max Johnson. Let's another one fly. Also caught. And what I was going to say about Nussmeyer is you know, he... He should be, in, well, let's get this pass by Johnson. Then we'll talk about some higher. Look at him just drop this right in the bucket. Wow. It's really the only place the ball can be placed. Really, really well done. Poised in the pocket, balanced. Great shot right there. See, you know, I talked about ball placement, putting the ball where your guy can get it and not have to make an adjustment. Those two throws right there are exactly what I'm referring to. Plenty of time again for Johnson, and he's right on the money on this drive. Three straight completions, two of them to John Trey Kirkland, and that one for a touchdown. It's really smooth and in rhythm. Get Max just dropped this one right there. And again, does he have to make an adjustment? Nope. Walks and runs. That accuracy, it's all being documented, too. When you're in a quarterback competition, every single thing you do is going to be scrutinized. You know, 313 to go in the third quarter. Max Johnson throwing the last two touchdowns. I know it's a spring game, but look at him. He's pretty fired up. We're fired up to have football back in Baton Rouge. Back-to-back -back touchdowns for Team Purple, both from Max Johnson as this quarterback competition continues to heat up this spring. Right now it's T.J. Finley working with the first-team offense. Keishon Butte, typically the top target. He's at the bottom of your screen, number one in white. But Jontre Kirkland stealing all the plaudits today. Kirkland's been playing for purple and white. Get this stat line, Tom. 17 receptions, 194 yards, two touchdowns. <laughs> right? I mean, unbelievable. When you play for great teams, I guess it helps, right? <laughs> yeah, it does. It, it, it definitely helps. That one right there, number 10 to Jure Jenkins, a six foot four junior. Um, you know, I, and, I, and I think the fact, and we, we've established that the running back position is down. We've got some injuries, uh, some limited numbers there. And I think it's actually helped in this setting to be able to just wing it as we see a big run right here. They heard you. The running back yeah. room, it is thin, but they do have Tyron Davis Price. He's the lone healthy running back available for the spring game. So he's been on the field all day long. 
Yeah, and they and they've worked their run game throughout the course of spring football, and 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 they know what their commodities are. They know with him, and when John John Emery comes back into the fold, going to have some young freshmen. Armani Goodwin, Rick Keener, two guys that are true freshmen. They're going to come in. Um, Trey Bradford's another one, but they don't have those guys right now. So you get to work on your passing game today. And again, try and establish some more playmakers, get some kids, some more catches, more reps, get them confident. I wanted to ask you about those two freshmen because you had them ranked in the ESPN 300, both guys in the top 10 for running backs at the position and both in the top 161 as Derek Stingley comes away with the football. They're shades of that freshman season where he was one of the best corners in the entire country. You love to see that from Derek Stingley. Yeah, and, and this is one of those balls that was ill-advised. He doesn't chart, T.J. Finley doesn't chart Stingley coming off the hash here, which ends up double-teaming Keishon Boutte, who's been kind of their go-to returning veteran, just makes a play on the football. That's two turnovers today for T.J. Finley at the quarterback spot. If they can get number 24 in purple playing the way he did in the freshman season when they won a national championship, this defense will look a lot different, and Stingley could be a top 10 pick a year from now. You take a look at him right here. He's up on the on the top of your screen. He loves to press. He's big, he's strong, he's long. And he's one of those guys that, that can take away a half of the field. Good feet, he can transition. Watch him close into the hip of the Georgia returning target and runs him right into the sideline. So he's taking away the field for the quarterback. Narrow margin of error, and there's nowhere to go for the ball. So he puts himself in a position to take the ball away. He's got great instincts, and, and he didn't play with those same instincts. He didn't sit, play with the same confidence and enthusiasm a year ago. And there were times on film where you were scratching your head saying, how can this be the same guy? So really looking forward to seeing him get back to form this fall. If he gets back to four, um, he'll probably be the number one corner on a lot of NFL teams' draft boards a year from now. Oh, there, there's no question about it. And he's got, and it's all up to him. He, he can set his own future. Everybody knows what he's capable of, the talent level. But I think what people are looking to see is how does he rebound? What type of season? Because, listen, Ed Ordron brought it up. He said, we spent a lot of time reading our press clippings, throwing purple and gold beads all over the place leading up to what we kicked <laughs> off last year. You know what? Derek Dingley probably spent a lot of time reading his press clippings about how good he was as a freshman. And that can catch up with you um, because when you, you, you start to win and you start to get good, right? Well, then what happens? That leads to complacency. What does complacency lead to? Poor performance. Poor performance leads to what? Losing. And so you gotta, you got to avoid that at all costs. Traquelin Rowan ends the third quarter with a sack. We saw an interception from Derek Stingley. A new look LSU trying to rebound from a disappointing 2020. We've got good practice so far in this first game. Football is back in Baton Rouge. Great to check out the 2021 LSU Tigers. Tom Luganville, Jail with you. Tom, these are the guys who have stood out so far. Yeah, they, and they've produced. I think we expected Miles Brennan produced. We talked about Keishon Butte being kind of the returning, reliable, proven playmaker. He's produced. But finding those other guys um, is, is the goal of spring football. Who's going to be the Terrace Marshall opposite of a Jamar Chase? You know, uh, who's going to step up and, and become that reliable guy that the quarterback stress? you got four quarterbacks battling. They're going to start to identify and gravitate towards guys that they trust. Right now, Javante Kirkland is turning into somebody that they can trust. Third and 17 coming up for Miles Brennan. How much do you take away from the spring football game performance, Tom, in a quarterback battle? Um... Well, I, I think it's it, you, you really got to be smart with the football. I, I think turnovers hurt you because it becomes the lasting impression of the 15 days. Uh, but it's one fifteenth of the puzzle, right? And, and everything, I can remember when I transferred to Georgia Tech, I was in the middle of a quarterback battle. I was a mid-year uh, transfer, and the quarterback I was battling with had, had been a returning starter. He had started the year before. 
coaches brought us in and said, guys, everything you do, we are going to chart. And then at the end of the day, to begin the next day, we're going to talk about your performance. We're going to get into a room. We're going to say, here's where you're right. Here's where you're wrong. This is where you stand. So you know that everything you do is being partially examined and it, you're hyper aware. And it's a, it's a competitive environment. But I don't want to take one day out of 15 and overshadow the other 14, particularly because we haven't been in that staff room. We haven't been in that meeting room examining every single play of all of these players that have taken place over the course of the, of, of the last you know couple of months of, of spring football. So it's a piece of the puzzle. It's certainly not the sum. Let's bring in Larisha Harris down on the sideline. We talked to oh, Coach how great is that? I had the opportunity to just ask him about how do you handle or keep your guys focused with so many distractions going on around the Baton Rouge area, but also across the nation with the social unrest. He told me that he's no longer doing what he used to do. Before it was he remained silent, and, you know, if he needed to educate his guys, he would. But when it pertained to football, it was all about football. And he says going forward, he's not doing that anymore. If there's a conversation that needs to be had, he's going to have it at the beginning of practice he has a leadership council who he relies on to hold him accountable and make sure that if there is any issues that need to be addressed he knows those issues so that he can bring them to the guys and they can have those conversations so he says they, they're having seminars and those seminars will continue but he's no longer being silent about issues that could uh, potentially impact his team and his players you know, Rich, it's interesting, and I remember vividly exactly what his statement was. I used to start every meeting, and it was all ball. You walked into this room, you walked into this building, it was all about football. He goes, now if something needs to be addressed, I start the meeting with it. And if that meeting ends up being 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or 30 minutes, we don't talk any football because we're, we're talking about something else that's important to our kids, important to our locker room, our environment. And again, isn't that all about building team chemistry? Isn't that all about creating an environment where you can trust your coach to go to your coach, your coach can trust you to, to be able to voice your opinion or be able to speak up in front of your teammates, in front of your coaching staff, uh, to have a, a, a thought-provoking conversation that maybe is important in that moment. Maybe in that moment it's more important than football. And uh, you're seeing a lot of coaches make a shift to this in, in, yeah. in, in our landscape over the last, you know, 12 to 15 to 18 months. And I think it's a great way to just allow him to have his players to, to have a voice and truly know that they're in an environment where they can feel comfortable about speaking their minds, especially about issues that directly affect them or impact them, whether it's um, immediate or long term. They know that they have an environment or a space where they can feel comfortable. And like you said, build that trust and know that that support is, is right here with them. You know, it's, it's interesting, Jay and, and Larisha, I couldn't agree with you more. You, you know, in recruiting players, you know, they don't like instability. They don't like uncertainty. Well, when they're within the program, all right, they, they want structure. They want discipline. They want direction. They want to know where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there, what they're supposed to be doing. But they also want to know that they're not in an environment where they feel like they can't go to their position coach or their coordinator or even their head coach and go knock on that door and say, hey, coach, do you have five minutes for me? I need to sit down and talk about mm -hmm. something. And if you're creating that type of environment with your players, then you're truly creating a family atmosphere. Brandon unloads a deep ball, almost intercepted. During that discussion, we missed an interception from Jay Ward. He's a converted corner to safety. And that, Tom, I wanted to ask you about that because when you get recruited to an SEC football program, it, it, it's very likely that you show up and they go, okay, you used to be a wide receiver, now you're a corner. You know, or we're going to put you at tight end, we're going to put you at safety. How malleable, flexible do you need to be when you go into a particularly a Power 5 program as a, as a top high school recruit? Well, the issue with most, not all, but with most is – They've all been patted on the back and told how good they, they are since they were 12 years old, right? So now you're, you're the big fish in a small pond as, as you're coming up through the recruiting ranks to the high school level. And then when you move on to an LSU or an Alabama or an Ohio State or a Clemson, premier top of the top programs, you're now just a little guppy in a big lake because everybody else that you're around was you before you got there. So now it comes down to 
what are you willing to do from a work ethic standpoint? What are you willing to do from a coachability standpoint? Or what are you willing to do from a helping the team standpoint? And if the coaches come to you and say, hey, man, right now we, we just don't see a fit for you here, but if you want over to this spot, you can find a way to get onto the field. And I think the kids that are open to that and that see the big picture, that make smart decisions and, and don't get their feelings hurt are the kids that will end up embracing it and then being successful uh, as a result of it. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. I think that what we've run into, and again, we're in the transfer portal era, and I'll, I'll say it, people don't like it, but you know what the transfer portal is? The transfer portal is chock full of players that are disgruntled because they're not playing. Let's just call it what it is. And that's the reality of the situation. Well, a lot of them make that decision so early because they become frustrated that they're not getting on the field right away that they haven't even given them a chance, given themselves a chance to compete yet. So the kids that do and that are willing to listen and be coached and be open to different options, they, they, they're ahead of the curve. Another great example of that, Jason Hines maybe embodies it for this LSU team. Senior starting right guard. He played defensive line in high school, also some offensive line. He thought it came in thinking, I'm a defensive player. They, they showed up. Nope, you're going to the old line, and now he's starting in the trenches at right guard. Yeah. I just feel like, you know, if you can make that change and do what's best for the team, you're, you're going to be better off for it in the long run. And the younger you are, the harder it can be to be willing to do that because you feel disrespected, your feelings are hurt, you know, your pride's been hurt, all of a sudden you're not being told how great you are. I always call it the de-recruitment phase, right? That guy that was recruiting you all of a sudden ain't so nice. All of a sudden he's got a little bit of a different demeanor, a different approach. Are you mature enough to handle that? Are you mature enough to be told, hey, we're going to move you over here and either embrace it and accept it or you fight it? And often and that's why you know I, we talk about this immediate eligibility and the transfer portal and the ability to play right away you know i i've, I've kind of lobbied I'm, I'm not anti-player movement but i i do think that that we should maybe put a bit of a restriction on at least staying in the program you're at for a calendar year or 18 months give yourself a chance to compete and work through things before you just make a rash decision and say i'm out of here because you're distrungled maybe you're not mature enough to make that decision and sit back and look at it through a different lens um and i and i hope as a result that we don't see a bunch of young players within their first calendar year of being on campus all of a sudden decide that they don't want to be there anymore we're getting another look at the early enrollee true freshman garrett nussmeyer Really nice First throw there. First pass of this drive, caught for 18 yards. What is Ed Orgeron getting in Nussmeyer, Tom? A gunslinger, a, a guy that can create with his feet. Um, the play's never dead. Uh, coach's kid, Doug Nussmeyer, is, is dad is a longtime college and, and current NFL coach. He's quarterback's coach right now with the Dallas Cowboys. Um, this guy just kind of just has a, an it factor, you know, is keeping plays alive. And, and it's just so important, so important if you're going to be a quarterback to have the opportunity to be an early enrollee and you see that on the move what a great throw that was the only place that ball could be and, and why i say it's so important and it's important to all positions but quarterback you know you're, you're coming in you're away from home you're getting acclimated academically socially athletically you're in a weight program a conditioning program unlike anything you've ever been in you get to go into spring football. You're not having to battle for a position. You're not trying to prepare for a game. Next thing you know, you get a semester done of school. You get into the summer. You got another semester of school done. Now you arrive in August. You're not the normal true freshman anymore. The maturity and the experience that you go through that you got behind you afford you the ability to just cut it loose. So I think it's really important for a guy like Garrett Nussmeyer to have these 15 days. Nussmeyer, an ESPN 300 quarterback that headlines this 2021 class. Here he is, the shades of Johnny Manziel, as Ed Orgeron told us, escapes the pocket, the pass incomplete, but does a great job keeping the play alive. You were just talking about it, Tom. There yeah. you saw it on display. Yeah, just to be able to extend with your feet. And, you know, he's going to learn that there's going to be some times you just got to throw the ball away. And he tries to, to dial in. It was a good catch. He's just out of bounds when he caught the football, but good throw he's rolling to his left it's not an easy throw and you've got to uh, throw a strike to the sideline but again you're a freshman what do you not want to do don't take risks with the football prove to the coaches that you can be trusted by doing the things that you're being taught play in and play out i, th I think we've seen some of that today from the freshman that was ojalari again in pursuit he has two sacks he has been in the backfield so often this spring 
That time Nussmeyer getting rid of it quickly. Didn't give the defensive line an opportunity to bear down on him. Tom, you're the director of recruiting for ESPN. I wanted to talk about this 2021 class. Obviously, Nussmeyer's the headline. The quarterback always is. But who else stands out to you that LSU's getting? Maybe someone who's not even on campus yet and that'll be coming in June. I, I think it's some of their young receivers. Um, and then Armani Goodwin, the, the running back. Really, really good player. One that is, oh, we see an interception here. First mistake from the young freshman. Yeah, Nussmeyer threw it right into the hands of Jared Small, who's had a terrific day today. He leads the team in tackles, and the senior from Baton Rouge, local product who played at Catholic. Just right place, right time on this one. Yeah, and again, a young freshman doesn't see the underneath linebacker. He thinks he's got the one-on-one -on, -one on the slant to the inside. And again, great teaching points here for Garrett Nussmeyer. He's going to go back, look at the tape. I promise you he's going to go back to the sideline right now. He's going to tell Jake Pete, he's going to say, I didn't even see him. I didn't even see him. And they're going to talk about why didn't you see him. And they'll be able to look at this from a high angle in the end zone and, and really dissect it. Uh, tomorrow, which is what, what, what you want to do with your quarterbacks and your young quarterbacks. I mentioned another freshman since we saw a defensive play being made there. Mason Smith, the six foot six, 320 pounder, uh, in state kid, uh, number zero, big time player along the defensive front. And he's a guy that's going to be in the rotation, may see some time starting in the ro uh, rotation here as a true freshman. I think he's got a, a future star written all over him. Jared Small, who just had the interception. He's got an interception. 14 tackles for the senior two, and I know it's just a spring game, but you know, you've got to feel pretty good if you're Andre Carter, def defensive line coach. This defense has, has played really well this afternoon. Played well, they've been active, they've given good effort, a lot of pressure with, with just your front four. I mean, that's the thing, can you create pressure without having to bring a fifth or sixth guy? LSU has proven to be able to do that today with both their ones and their twos. First year defensive line coach Carter brings in a lot of experience in the NFL. That was Jaqueline Roy, the sophomore, another local prod product, played right down the road at University Lab. And there, there's Mason. There's big Smith, Mason. Big numbers. Look zero. He doesn't. He doesn't look like a high school senior. Oh my goodness. No, he does not. He, he's gonna be a good one one day. He's got, uh, I, he's got a lot of the traits that Tyler Shelvin has. Now, Tyler Shelvin had a hard time acclimating and being the impact player he was expected to be early. I don't think that's going to be the case, number zero. Roy coming uh -oh. strong again. This defensive line is feasting right now. You, look at that. Look at those guys. They're running the twist up there. And then the right side, you've got one-on-one -on -one against the offensive tackle. Number 74 in the offensive line. That's Marcus Dumerville. That's the other true freshman. Excuse me, the redshirt freshman. 6'5", 310. And it, we know LSU is establishing their offensive front. What you're trying to establish is spring ball. Who are going to be your twos and threes? Getting them meaningful reps. So you got Jaqueline Roy, who's a veteran, going against the redshirt freshman and Marcus Dumerville creating the sack there. Preston Stafford in for that field goal attempt and he missed it as this fourth quarter winds down let's jump ahead to the fall take a look at the lsu schedule trying to bounce back from that disappointing five and five campaign how can this team get back to the shades of 2019 as you look at the schedule tom well listen your 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 home games i i like the home games so you got you, you got three environments that are awfully difficult to play in at auburn florida and a and m and you get all of them at home. That's really, really important. Um, but I think that two-game stretch, um, and, and it's, you're going to have a bye in between, on the road at El Ole Miss and on the road at Alabama, that two-game stretch, if, if LSU gets back to the team I think they're capable of being, then you're, you're going to see a good football team heading into that Ole Miss game, and that's when things will get dicey in the SEC in the month of November. No doubt about it in your mind, though. This team will be well improved from the team we saw a year ago, right? Oh, I think so. I, I, they got too good of players. I think they've got a refocused energy. They were embarrassed. I think their pride was stung a little bit. And, um, and, and, and they've got quarterbacks that they can rely on. I, I think it's, it's, it's so important. 
and, and if you look at this offensive comparison graphic here and you, and you see the glaring difference between that national championship season of 2019 and this past fall, don't kid yourself. The defensive side of football had a hand in that. Losing your quarterback in Miles Brennan, who was getting hot in week three against Missouri, having the defensive performance that they had, it, they all played a role. You know, there's no fingers to be pointed in just one area for the offense uh, not being up to snuff a year ago. And Ed Orgeron told us that while he was disappointed with 2020, he said sometimes the return to the mountaintop to get the highest of highs, you need to go through the lowest of lows. He felt that the 2019 national championship team did that in 2017. And then, boom, stayed together, continued to get better. You throw a Joe Burrow into the mix, and you end up as national champions. And he says, who knows how this iteration of LSU will turn out, but the way the group stuck together, played together, and found ways to win, and then a lot of them return, makes us yep. feel really good about, about his chances for this coming year. Yeah, you know, and, and I had LSU, you know what, and, and then Ordron talked about how did the 2019 team get built? Well, it got built at the end of the 27, 2017 season, throughout the 2018 season, and he referenced the game when they lost to Troy. And he said that loss for us started to build our program into what we became in 2019. And now, with the offseason we had, with the on-field performance we had in 2020, we have plenty of work to do and plenty of evidence that shows us we're not where we need to be right now. And he goes, and it's a great motivator. He mentioned also how unselfish this group is, how the team chemistry has come together and that's something that you said when you look at the 2019 team yeah they had a lot of talent but the way that talent came together it was not a group of individuals this was a team that really believed in one another you know when, when you have chemistry you can see it you can feel it the problem is you can't bottle it and sell it and if you could you'd never <laughs> have to work another another day in your life you can return players you can return notable players but you can't return the same locker room that's new each and every year. And I think that's one of the things, as you referenced, Coach likes this team. He likes their hunger, likes their edge, says the team likes each other. I think that's a big component of it. So I, I do expect them to get back to, uh, to kind of being, are they going to be the 2019 team? Are we going to see another Joe Burrow? I don't know. Uh, are we going to see the team we saw last fall? I don't think we'll see that in a million years. I think, I think this team is a totally different unit than that one. Is there a unit that impressed you most today? Thought the receivers came up because they knew they had to. I think that everybody's been talking about who's going to replace this guy, who's going to replace that guy. If I'm a wideout, that's a personal challenge to me. I don't want anybody on a message board, on a podcast, on the Internet saying, oh, everybody, LSU doesn't have any more wideouts anymore. And that's been the question in this offseason. Who in, 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 in Kirkland right there, number 13, monster day. All right, well, he showed up. We, we knew that Keishon Boutte was going to be the established guy. He showed up. Who's going to be another two to three guys that they've got to identify? But I, I think this is a good start and a good end to 15 days of spring football. It's so funny, and you're the expert, and I ask you, and your opinion is the only one that matters. I would have actually told you the secondary. <laughs> I thought McLaughlin and... And uh, Jay Ward looked really strong in that safety position. We saw Derek Stingley get right. an interception. So it's fun. You know, it, it's all perspective. But it's good to see both those units show some flashes because those are the two units that really struggled a year ago. Exactly. And, and it's really the safety position. The corner position, I think, is, is anchored up pretty well. We didn't see Eli Ricks today. We know what we've got with, with Derek Stingley. We've talked about him today and what he needs to get back to in, in terms of being true to form. They're, they're going to be fine on their back end. I, I really think they are. And I think a lot of that's going to be scheme-based, their new approach, keeping it simple, letting them play fast, kids not being confused and thinking. So again, they're, 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 and, and, and you know what? While we're having this discussion about areas that have been addressed or still need to be addressed, Garrett Nussmeyer, and I want to point this out, throws an interception on a, on a slant route with a linebacker that he doesn't see. What does he do the next series? Comes right back into game, short memory, marches him right down the field, through the points, keeps his eyes downfield, boom, unleashes it, touchdown. As a coach, I'm Gate Pete. I've learned something about that guy right there. And it, we, we threw him out there. He just had a, a, an interception. What's he going to do? How's he going to respond? Those are things you'll love to see if you're a coach.
Still plenty of question marks. Who will be the starting quarterback come fall 2021? How will these new offensive and defensive coordinators and Jake Beats and Durante Jones fare in Ed Orgeron's system? But I'll tell you what, Tom, plenty of fun. Great to see fans back in Tiger Stadium. And we saw some flashes of a team that hopes to return to their 2019 glory. Oh, we did, and they've got a lot of components. I, I, I think the, the, the thing that you work about as a coach, and fortunately for LSU, it, it looked like all's well that ends well. You want to get out of these 15 days injury-free. You want to get out of this spring game with no injuries, and it looks like LSU was able to accomplish that.